And the first thing that we want to shine light on is the fact that the world did not create marriage. We often get all the perceptions we have of marriage and relationships a lot of times comes from the world. What the news says our marriage should be like, what celebrities say our marriage should be like, what, you know, whoever says our marriage should be like. But God created marriage the moment that he put Adam and Eve together. It was God's idea for a man and a woman, one man, one woman, to live prosperously and fruitfully for their entire life. He created marriage, and anything created by God has a purpose. The Bible says in Genesis 2, and Pastor Rocky's going to get to this in just a minute, but that his plan was for one man, one woman, one lifetime. Um, he created marriage, and he purposed it. Everything he does has a purpose. So, so we got to go back to creation. we gotta go, We got to go back to Adam and Eve, see what, see what God was intending to do with his. So we're going to go Genesis 1, 26 through 31. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit of the trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food. We're not, we're not supposed to eat salad, okay? As food for the wild animals. That's rabbit food, okay? That's scripturally proven right there. Uh, steak is good for you. Fruit is good for you. Don't eat salad. It's for the animals. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I've given you every green plant as food for all the, all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the small uh, animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life, and that is what happened. Then God looked over all he made and he said, it was very good. So I'm going to look at that for a minute. For a minute. And, he's, and so now we'll get into the roles of marriage and all that later on. Uh, but tonight we want to talk about the purpose of marriage. So number one, we are made in his image. One way of saying that, we are made to reflect the image of God. And so we use this scripture all the time when we go, I was made in God's image, but he said he created them in, his, in their image. He, he wasn't talking about individuals. He was talking about couples. Now, it can be used individually as well, but your marriage was supposed to be a reflection of the Trinity. So the first thing you need to know is it was intended to be a, re, uh, a reflection of God. How so? Just as one God is a triune being, your marriage should be three-part manifesting in one entity. Three parts. It was never intended for it to be you and her against the world. It was supposed to be you, her, and God against the world. Come on. It was never intended to be between two people. And we're going to get into that more in just a second. Uh, your marriage was never designed to please one another. Somebody say amen. Uh, your, your marriage was designed to have three equal parts all working towards a common purpose. So we are, so, so we are three parts just like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but we are, we are our own people. I want you to know just because you get married, you don't lose your identity. I think sometimes, uh, sometimes we, we tend to gravitate towards one or the other's identity, and so we lose ourself in the process. And then when we're not ourselves, then we're unfulfilled because we've got personal callings, individual callings on our life that we're not fulfilling. And again, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here, uh, but... You, your spouse, and God all working together towards purpose. So even though Father, Son, Holy Spirit is, is three in one, they're all working. They, what do they have in common purpose? They're all different. They all have different assignments, but they're all working towards a common purpose. So our, our marriage is supposed to, is supposed to ref, be a f reflection of that. That's good. So... I have a motto that I try to live by, and it's life is your ministry. So when people see you, they should see him, right? Whenever people see your actions both in the church and at home, they should see the same thing. They should see him, right? 
And so today I wrote down a statement that says, what if you saw your marriage as a ministry to the world? What if you saw me and him, you and him, you and her as a ministry to all of the world that's watching you? How differently would we take our marriage if we looked at it as a ministry? Because that's truly what it is. And how does your marriage, and how, what does this say? How you do marriage, you type that. So that's your <laughs> words. <laughs> how you do marriage determines how those around you do marriage, meaning you have a platform. Whether you use that platform for good or not good is up to you, but you and your spouse, you and your future spouse have a platform. And those that are watching you, all those little children at home, all the kids here in the building, the couples that you surround yourself, you are influencing them by the way you live your marriage with your spouse. So think about that. Also your coworkers. It's true. That's why we don't talk trash about our wives to our coworkers. Because you're the only Jesus in the workplace. And so they, now you say, well, if the Christian can talk bad about his wife, I'm going to talk bad about mine. And now we've turned into every time we turn around, now you've given him not only permission to talk bad about his wife, but also permission to talk bad about your wife. You just made me think of something. Whenever we first got married, this is not in our notes, but whenever we first got married, I don't remember who it was, but they said to me, the worst thing you can do as a new wife, trying to figure this out, trying to figure out how to get along with your husband, is go to your parents and tell them what he's doing wrong. So I don't know if we have any new relationships in here or will be new relationships in here, but the worst thing you could do is tell your circle what that person is doing wrong. It's just a piece of advice there. Are we going to put this so up? So we've got an image if we got it up there. You didn't we'll like the it. one I drew and texted you to you today? She drew one. I Googled <laughs> one. That's just how it works, right? So whenever we're looking at the reflection of how a marriage should reflect the Trinity, if you imagine this triangle with God, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, right? If you will imagine this as a marriage with God, Jesus at the top, and the husband and wife, the closer the husband and wife get to God themselves, the closer they are to one another. Amen. You cannot be who your spouse needs you to be until you're who God needs you That's to be. That's right. That's right. Straight up. You can't, you can't, and you cannot separate the two. I need you to know that. You cannot be a great Christian, great servant in the home and then go home and treat your wife like crap. Come on. That's good. I, that was free. I didn't get that. I, I cut you off. Here you go. No, you're good. So as each of us pursue God individually and get closer to God individually, you in turn will get closer to one another. And I want to I want to say something here. If you're looking at this triangle and so say the husband goes up higher than the wife, the Bible where the this is where the Bible talks about a concept don't be unequally yoked. And we tell it that well, don't be unyoked with with somebody that's that's a satanist. That's what we think that means, but really it means if I am tied to someone if I'm tied to someone and I'm going at a different pace than them, I'm choking them. So if, if there was a, if there, if you take the husband and the wife and you tie a rope around their neck and one of them gets to the top, you're hanging the other one. And, and you are sucking the life out of, some, out, out of your spouse when you are called to help them get where they're going. This is supposed to be team effort. This is supposed to be 100-100, not 50-50. The Bible says an unbalanced scale is an abomination to God. Come on, because if this is an equal three-part, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, me, my wife, and God, then it ain't just me and God up here and she's down here. And it ain't just her and, her and him up there and I'm just dragging along. I'm just grateful to be a part of that. We've got to come get on each other's level and help each other be better and get closer to God. You know, and that may bring up the question, how do I do that? Like, I feel like I'm super close to God, but my spouse is not even trying. So how would you answer how you do that? So, so you've, got to, you've got to humble yourself. Yeah, you've got to humble yourself and come down here, and you've got to ask that question. We're going to get into communication next week. i got to ask that question. What is struggling? What, in what ways, and instead of looking at them and the things they're doing wrong, in what ways can I be a better helpmate to elevate you? Yeah. Because yeah. the first thing we do is go, well, they're not in church. They don't want it to be close to Jesus. There's nothing I can do about it. But if you'll humble yourself and present it in a way like, look, I, I, I want us to go through this together. Mm -hmm. I want us to get closer to God together. Mm -hmm. 
then then now that that's how we that's that's how we solve that to answer your question is I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to come down here in in my mind if I'm higher if I'm quote unquote higher than you I'm going to come down here on your level and I'm going to lift you up because guess what there's going to come a season where you're higher than me and I need you to lift me up by loving, like selflessly, by serving, try to outserve one another. Like not for conditions, but unconditionally, like outserve, outlove one another. So our walks were God, nor our marriages were ever about a destination, but rather a journey. You never arrive, but you're constantly improving and going higher. There is no top of this. Uh, you know, there, there is a top physically if you look at that, but, but we, I don't think we ever ever get to this pinnacle where we can no longer grow in Christ. I don't care if you've been serving God your whole life and been on the missionary field like Brother Ike. I'm, he is still learning new things. God, otherwise, what's the point? If God's not, like, we can't con- comprehend everything of God anyway, right? So we have to realize that this is a journey and we're not trying to get to a place. We're not, you know... Like you start dating, you're trying to get to the promise ring, trying to get to the engagement, trying to get to the marriage. And then once we get to the marriage, we quit going somewhere. We quit pursuing. We quit, we quit pursuing one another. We quit pursuing God. Okay. So we, we have to realize that this is a, this is, this is a never ending journey. Of course, there's going to be ups and downs, but you've got to fight at every single step and not think of yourself higher. But think of yourself on the same level. If I am higher, it's because I have not humbled myself and I'm in pride. And pride will go. We all say pride goes before a fall, but it says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So both of those apply here. Pride, pride will destroy your marriage. And to think you are higher in the spirit will, will make you fall. So we've got, to, we've got to make sure that we are both climbing this in a balance. And, and I'm going to tell you something else. Even if I'm going on a good direction, if I'm, if I'm not lifting them up, they're weighing me down. If we're talking about a scale, old school scale, one side is, is higher than the other. All, they're doing is, all, all we're doing is holding each other back if we're not lifting each other up. So you want to say, oh, they're holding me back. And the first thing we want to do is cut the rope. Guess what? You still ain't got a reflection of God because now it's just you and God. You done messed up the whole Trinity reflection because you got out of covenant. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, I, want, I, just, I want you to know, I wrote this in the notes. Sam and I have not arrived. We're still on the journey. We're still on the journey. And, you know, I, maybe it's because I love business and, and, and growing businesses. And I always, we always use the term the hustle. I love the hustle. I'm not so destination oriented that I love the process of things. And so I'm committed to the process, not the results. In your marriage, you have to be committed to the process. You have to be committed to growth. You have to be committed to not just your growth. You got to be committed to if, if, if she is, is not going with me, I'm not going. Because we are now one flesh. Come on, we're, we're, we got to go together. We can't scripturally get to a place without the other one. So our marriage has to be a reflection of the Trinity, husband, wife, God. Number two, I need to know that my marriage has an assignment. My assignment was not to get ugly eyes, get in bed, and make babies. That was not my assignment. That's not, that's not the purpose of your marriage. <laughs> uh, I did. I lost my place. My mind got in the gutter there for a minute. There, that's what happens here. Uh, your marriage was not intended to be a result of passion or a pursuit of happiness. You need to realize that your, the assignment of your spouse is not to make you happy. It's the greatest revelation you could ever have. You've, we've got unrealistic expectations that they're supposed to make me happy. They're supposed to fulfill me. No. You know what's going to fulfill you? Getting closer to God. You know what's going you know to fulfill you? Why is it that we, that we will minister to people on the streets and get them to where they need to be, but we won't minister to our spouse and get them where they need to be? Our, our greatest ministry is our home, guys, because it's, it's about the next generation. We can minister out here all we want, but if we, don't, if we don't set that example for our families, 
then guess what? We're just screwing up the next generation because now, now they don't want to be in the church because they're like, oh, mom and daddy went to church and they did outreach and they did the Christmas blessing and they did all this stuff. And then when they got home, they tore each other's heads off. Like, I don't want to be a part of that. And so, it's, so, so we got to first humble ourselves and minister to our own wives and husbands before we ever worry about giving marriage counseling to everybody else. You know, and going back to what you just said, the world has taught us that we need to find someone who completes us. Don't you hear that all the time? I got to find a man that completes me. I got to find a woman that completes me. When in fact, it was never designed to be that way. You were supposed to put yourself with God and become complete in him. And whenever two complete people come together, you're unstoppable. So you're not looking for a spouse to complete you. God is that source that, can, that completes you. Each and every one of you were designed with a kingdom assignment that you, that, and then that you were placed together to help one another fulfill it. So I want you to know that just because Sam and I are married, we still have individual callings. But those, those callings are, there, there's things that I have to help her with, my, that I'm strong in and she's weak in. There's things that she has to help me in. Well, that's hard to admit, right? And so... <laughs> So we, we each have individual assignments, and I, I, heard, uh, I heard a teaching. I was in preparation. I was listening to some, some stuff a guy was teaching, and he said, you know, when we light that unity candle, at the, that's kind of a thing of the past now, but, um, but you light this unity candle, and you blow out the individual flames, and he said, that's unscriptural. He said, what it should be is you don't lose your individualism, but you do burn together. Okay. And if, if, if I put out your flame, then it then you're, you're pulling from my flame. And so then we're, we're, we're pulling on one another instead of just making each other, instead of fueling one another. Two flames shine brighter than one. We're going together towards, we're, we should be going together towards kingdom purpose. Genesis 128 gives us our kingdom purpose. God said, he blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful. Now, and if God is saying something directly, that's a commandment. You guys realize that? He's saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, all the animals that scurry along the ground. We talked about all the plant food, all that stuff. Then he said, he looked down and saw it's very good. We were designed to be fruitful, fruits of the spirit. We, we think of it as like fruitful and we, fruit of the womb, fruit of the loom, right? But we're talking about, this is like, we're supposed to be, I'm supposed to be bringing out kindness in her. I'm supposed to be bringing out patience in her. I've taught her a lot of patience over so whenever the Whenever I'm not, is, it because, is that because you're lacking and doing that? <laughs> <laughs> be, be fruitful, <laughs> multiply. That's the fun part. Praise God. Woo, woo. Okay. Uh, govern the earth. That's Holy Spirit authority. We just talked about that in our Holy Ghost uh, uh, series. We're supposed to be walking in authority and reign. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, how many of our relationships look like that? No. So what happened? I just read to you that God looked down and said, it's very good, right? First, he said, when he saw a man alone, he said, that's not good. That's not good. This dude needs some help, right? I need to... I need to do man 2.0. I need to create a better version. Sorry, men. They're better than us. They're smarter than us. Uh, we're just brute strength cavemen, but that's okay. We got our place. Uh, praise God. We're going to talk about the places in the marriage. Uh, but, but, but so what happened? He looks down. He said, it's very good. But, but we all know that dang woman God gave Adam, ate that apple. Literally all hell broke loose. <laughs> right? And now we have to do laundry. It's bad. That's her joke. Uh, but <laughs> so the worst thing is not, not she, she says the worst thing is not childbearing, but that we have to now do laundry. <laughs> uh, why? Because the kingdom, it, it, so, so we blame it on the fact of, uh, okay, why is it like this? Because now we know evil because they, they ate of the knowledge of good and evil, right? But I disagree with that. I think it's because we broke covenant with God. We, there was an agreement. So we have to define the covenant and look at what it was supposed to be like uh, because, because let's face it, most of us when we were looking for a spouse never even consulted God about it. I did not. I did not consult God. I put more value in whether her daddy would let me or not because I had to. 
I never asked God if this was who she, who he had for me. And so, uh, <laughs> it's a wonder we made it. Come on, have a little faith in us. Uh, but I never put God into the, to the equation. Uh, I asked her dad, never, never asked God. So here, so here we are asking God to bless something, asking God to fix something that we never actually invited him in to be a part of in the first place. Good. We never prayed for our spouse. We never prayed about getting married. We checked the bank account. We asked our uncle that we revere. We asked grandpa. We asked her dad. We asked my dad what we should do, but we never consulted God about it. And then we can't figure out why all hell has broke loose in our marriages because we never, just as Adam and Eve had gotten himself into a mess with breaking covenant, we never got into true covenant because we didn't understand what covenant was. Marriage was designed to be a covenant between you, God, and your wife. Or your, or your spouse. So what is a covenant? According to the Strong's definition, it's a disposition, a testament, a contract. And I love what it said. It said, especially a divisory will. I was like, what is that? I had to look it up. And uh, a divisory will is, is a will that is subscribed in the presence of three or four witnesses. Or it's utterly void and has no effect. Come on, so a covenant is basically an agreement between three or more people with one divisor, being God, to determine the future. Come on, it's, it, it literally said, when you look up the definition of what a divisory will was, it said that if there's not three or more involved, in the, it says if there's not the presence of three or more, it will be of no effect. Come on, that's, that's applying a natural thing to a supernatural covenant that, that God said. He said, if there's not three or four, it's not. But if you allow God, a covenant, to, to be this agreement where all three of us can come together and you will allow God to be the divisor, God to be the one that, that sets the precedence, then, then can, we, can he, he determine what our future looks like. So your marriage is supposed to be an agreement between you, your spouse, and God by which God determines the future. We have to, if we're going to get back to the place where God looks down at our marriages and said, it's very good, we've got, to, we've got to go back to the spiritual concept of the covenant. We've got to go back and we've got, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Bible, the covenant is listed 280 times. 280 times God uses covenant. God used covenant for Noah. God used covenant with Adam and Eve. God used covenant with Abraham. There is so many. I mean, you could go all night. God used covenants. Why? He said because, because there's a contract that has requirements in which I can, know, I can move. So, so you have to realize in this agreement, God can only do things if you're doing your part. If I put a contract in on a, on a house to buy a house, if I don't meet the needs of that contract, then that contract is null and void. If we are not fulfilling what God has asked us to do in our part of the covenant, then our covenant becomes null and void. He must be the divisor, not the husband and not the wife. We've got to be, we've got to be led by God in everything we do. We've got to, there's requirements of this thing. It's required, we're, gonna, we're not going to get into all the requirements of covenant tonight because that's a whole other teaching about all the, all the requirements of the husband, all the requirements of, of the wife. But Sam's going to talk to you about a, a natural contract versus a covenant. Yeah, so here's some differences between a contract. A lot of people look, well, you know, we signed the marriage certificate and we, you know, we signed the paper, we did the contract, but let's look at contract versus covenant. In marriage so a contract marriage would be between two people the husband and the wife a covenant marriage would be between the three people like pastor Rocky's been saying the husband the wife and God um, a contract marriage seeks the individual's best interest where a covenant marriage seeks God's will for our best interest together a contract marriage negotiates the terms and a covenant marriage just serves each other a contract marriage keeps records of performance, and a covenant marriage keeps records of no wrong. A contract marriage would punish failure, and a covenant marriage would forgive failure. A contract marriage is, has a goal of just winning, and a covenant marriage has a goal of worshiping together. 
A contract marriage has what you would consider a professional relationship, where a covenant marriage has a personal relationship. So Ephesians 5, 25 through 33, let me pull it up on my phone because... While she's looking that up, I, I, I just felt something in my spirit when she said, Seeks my, a, 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 a contract marriage would seek my best interest. So, so a, a contract in a real estate deal protects me from getting hurt. In a covenant, it's trying to get something to you, not, something, not protect you from something. Come on, he's, try, he's, trying to get, he's trying to get you to a place, not protect you from something. So I'm going to read from Ephesians 5, 25 through 33 in the NLT. It says, for husbands, this means to love your wives. Um, just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is also an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Come on, we wrote down, <laughs> our, submission, our submission to one another reveals our reverence for Jesus. So we, we look yeah. at that as, oh, I'm supposed to submit to your feet. No, that word submission translates as reverence. I'm supposed to, you're, you're supposed to revere your husband. And, and, and men, you're, you're supposed to love them like you love yourself. Come on, we're all a little egotistic, right? All of us men. So technically, how we bit. treat one another is a reflection of our reverence for Jesus. Amen. How can you have reverence for Jesus and not love your wife? It's true. So we're going to talk just a little bit about submission. We're not going to get too far into this tonight. But a lot of times we feel like it's taken out of context where like, oh, a submissive wife is just a doormat. And he can run over her all day long and that's just what she's supposed to be. Be submissive, right? But after all, we've got to remember that Jesus was submissive to what God asked him to do, right? Whenever we submit to God, we become more willing to obey his command to submit to others, whether that's our spouse, at the job place, in our country that we live in. Um, in a marriage, both the husband and the wife are called to submit. The wife is willing, will willing, oh, I'm sorry, let me start this over. The wife is to willingly follow her husband's leadership in Christ. The husband is to put aside his own interests in order to care for his wife. Submission is rarely a problem in homes where both spouses have a personal relationship with Jesus. Marriage is not about giving and taking, but it's about giving and giving and giving and giving. And whenever a man is fully surrendered to God, ladies, it makes it a whole lot easier to desire to submit to him because you trust who he is in Christ. So if the man will take care of himself and his personal relationship being fully surrendered and submitted to following Christ, the whole submission thing is, is I mean, it just comes naturally because you want to be underneath that leadership. So I want to talk to the men for a minute. A lot of men will go, well, well she's not a submissive wife. The, the scripture tells her to be a submissive wife. But she's not submissive because you're not a leader. How's she going to submit to something you don't know where you're going? How are you going to lead you don't know where you're headed? You're supposed, you have to answer to God. God came down after the fall and he looked for Adam. He didn't look for Eve. He knew which one ate the fruit first. He knew which ones. But, but the problem was that the, the, here's what the devil did. The devil got, him, got the covenant out of order. He didn't go talk to Adam. Because he knew God had already talked to Adam. So when you allow outside voices to come in the back door and get your, get your covenant flipped upside down, come on, I promise you, there ain't a woman in here that wouldn't serve a God-fearing man. Like, baby, you lead. Can I tell you? 
It ain't, there ain't, there ain't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just going, I'm just going to get real. There ain't nothing sexier than watching that man worship and fall to his knees and be, and be totally, and to be totally vulnerable in the, in the spirit of God. I promise you there's not. So if you're, if you're in here going, I hope to get out of this series that my wife would understand the scripture that she should submit to me. <laughs> then check. we're going to check you tonight because if she's not submitting to you, it's probably because you're not a very good leader. It's probably because she don't see, she don't see you making the relationship better. You know why women lead? Because men are not leading. That's why in the church they had to say, could you tell the women not to preach because the men are not preaching? It had nothing to do with women. It, it was because us men wasn't stepping up, fellas. So now we got this whole doctrine where women can't preach in the church because men wouldn't preach. What is he trying to do? We're trying to reestablish the order of the covenant. There's, there's, a, there's a pecking order. Just as you come to the, you come to the church, God has established, you're, gonna come, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to come straight to me. You're going to come to secondary leadership, and then it's going to come up to me. There's, there's, a, there's, a pecking, there's, a, there's an established chain of command in your covenant. It does not mean you are better than one another. It just means, it, women, can I tell you, as bad as you think you want to lead that marriage, you don't want to answer to it like, like, like we're going to have to. I promise you, most of that, that's, what, that's what's wrong with a lot of our marriages. So we just submit to y'all. Because we're like, that way we can blame it on y'all. Like, God, she, this woman you gave me, God, he said, no, 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 no. I told you, you were supposed to communicate with her. I told you what not to do. I told you to lead this relationship. If you were, and so we've got this thing switched up. But I want to say this too. Ladies, just because he's not leading doesn't mean you don't submit to him. It does not say you submit to him if he's a godly man. You, and this is where that, that triangle comes back into play so many times throughout this. Is that if I'm doing my part, it's going to elevate you because we're, we're attached. We're one person. We're one person. We ain't got separate bank accounts. Come on, we're going to get into money. We're not going to get a whole lot into money because right after this, we're going to do Dave Ramsey right after our relationship series. But... We ain't got separate this, separate that. Everything I got's yours. Everything you got's mine. Everything we got's is ours. That was good Ebonics right there, okay? Great. <laughs> so, so, men, as much as you love hunting, as much as you love to serve yourself, come on, we're, we're, we're selfish, men. We ought to be serving. Can I tell you, I tell you can I tell you what will... What will make the best marriage is that serving competition. I'm putting, I'm, I'm dying to self. Yeah. I love what JD, JD prayed that over us one night in a men's group out here in the foyer. They asked me to pray. He said, man, I pray that we die to self. I pray that we die to self because when we submit ourselves, when we're both trying to get low, what do we both do? We're both on our face in prayer. We're, we're both submitting ourselves. Did you have anything else you want to add?